Nat, lovely to meet you. Um, where are you? Where are you based? Uh, I'm based in Montreal. I'm originally from France. Uh, however, I uh, emigrated here a couple of decades ago and I still live in Montreal. So that's, that's where all your work is based from there? Well, usually I travel a lot uh, at, in the international to uh, do my work, uh, but I must admit, like many me, many other people, uh, for the last year, uh, most of my work is based in Montreal or around it. Yeah, I've never been there. Obviously, you like it. It's a nice place. Yeah, it's it's a nice place. You do have real winter with a lot of snow <laughs> and cold and really real summer with a, a warm weather and a hot water. So uh, we have, you know, come some extremes. <laughs> it sounds it sounds lovely. It sounds lovely. I was just looking at your, your website. Um, I'm just reading now. Uh, Award-winning underwater filmmaker, expedition leader, public speaker, TED speaker. Um, that's a lot. It's, and, and I've been looking at the things you've done. Amazing, wonderful films. But I was looking at the TED talk that you were giving. Uh, yeah, TEDx. On your website. Um, but of, unfortunately for me, it was all in French. And I, I missed the gist of it. Can you just tell us what the talk was about? Well, the, the talk, you know, is, uh, I must say, kind of a where I'm in my life right now. You know, um, I started as a, a filmmaker. Uh, when I was young, I studied at the university to make um, documentaries. And then I start diving and doing film. And you know, when you start something, it's more about the tool you use that you're interested in. And then the more you do it, it's more about what you see and then what you feel, the environment. And then you become more and more concerned about it. So the TEDx talk was really uh, what I call now, you know, from the tip of the iceberg to my glass of water. It's our relationship to the water water to the fresh water and how as a scuba diver we we are a privileged witness of everything that is going down down there because we can see it and once you see it you can't deny it and there's no way you you're just gonna stay there and do nothing so the the TEDx talk is really you know what how we consider the water um the drinking water because as you know, you know, if we don't have drinking water in within three to five days, we're going to die. No matter where you are, no matter uh, how wealthy you are, we are on the same page, the same level. So we, we need that drinking water. And even in Canada, we have a lot of it, but it's still in, in a fragile state. We take it for granted, uh, but we shouldn't. I was uh, just watching a documentary last night, I think it was, and it was about waste food and um, how supermarkets are giving it to food banks for people that can't afford food. And one of the things that supermarkets are throwing out was bottled water. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, who throws away water? I didn't even think... I know the plastic can actually, after a while contaminate the water itself but that yeah. takes a long time it seemed a very strange thing to waste yeah it, it is it's really odd but uh, we, we you know we we live in really a uh, wealthy country and we 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 lost our relation to the essence to nature you know, we don't have to fight to find food. We don't have to go and chase it and hunt for it or fish it. Most of the people, we do it for fun because we don't have to. We just have to go to the grocery, buy something. And, you know, the, so the value, uh, because we don't put too much effort, too much work and sweat sometime to, to mm -hmm. go and get our food. I think we kind of lose that, that you know, true relation to it. Yeah, yeah, very true. Did you find it easy to actually get into uh, into filmmaking, into the industry? 
<laughs> no, there's nothing easy there. Um, when, when I finished university, I, I started uh, at the National Film Board of Canada, and I was really uh, lucky and it was such a great opportunity because, as you may know, the National Film Board of Canada was, at that time, one of the biggest institutions for documentary worldwide. So I was able to talk and see and watch other filmmakers and how they were able to craft their films and make the research and all. So it's where I started and, I, and still nowadays, I still have that way of envisioning a, a film, all the process. And even if I don't only do documentaries, because, you know, like last week I was uh, doing a, a, a commercial for uh, the Olympics. So, you know, it may vary a lot, but it's, it's not an easy work. It's not an easy path. And most specifically on the water, when, you know, it's the you're, you're living, it's your job, it's not a hobby. Uh, you know, there's always our days and uh, finding, you know, your way, your path, but there's always a way to, to find it. So, you know, at the end of the, of the year, it's, it's my job. I, I don't know what else I could do. Uh, so I keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel exactly the same. I, I sometimes think, you know, if, if, it, if I didn't do what I've done with filmmaking, what would I have done? And I have no idea. I can't think of anything else at all. What, what, did you say you started off with underwater work? No, no. Um, ah. I, I started as uh, a camera assistant person uh, ah. using film 35 millimeters, 16, super 16. Yeah. And then I became a diver. So, you know, it's my point of view is really a filmmaker, uh, a documentary person point of view. And then once I, I hit the water, uh, it took me maybe two years, maybe more before I bought my first camera because I wanted to be, you know, like uh, absolutely uh, stable on the water and to know everything. I became uh, a technical diver. And then I said, you know what? Now I think I can bring a camera. But at that time, we didn't have any GoPro small cameras. So before you dare to take a camera on the water, you really made sure that you were ready and you knew what you were doing. Yeah, the ties are very difficult or very different then. It's, <laughs> my first camera was a wind-up Bolex, so 16 millimeter. And, uh -huh. you know, it's not like you can practice it with it without money because mm -hmm. film costs money. You can't just look at it like you can with the digital things now. And, and the size of all the equipment. I remember the, f the first real commercial camera I bought my girlfriend, wife, and I sat down and it was a decision either to buy that camera kit or at the time, basically put most of a deposit on a house. Mm -hmm. And those are, you know, that's the kind of cost of how things were. I mean, things, things yeah. I won't say are easy now, but the, the, the breadth of things that you can do with equipment now yeah. is fantastic. It's it's different. But you know, what I, I, I loved about film is because you, you had to have a really specific vision. As you remember, you know, like 400 feet of roll was 12 minutes in, in 16. Otherwise, it was like two minutes and a half. So you had to know exactly what you were looking for. And then you had to bring that roll of film to the laboratory and wait you know, that they can develop it. And then you can see the images. And before you see them with the sound sync, it could take like two weeks. And when we were traveling overboard, uh, sometimes it was like one month, two months before we were able to see the rush and to see, well, if we got it or not. But it was, there was some magic. I, I can always remember, you know, going in the, the, the dark room and in the projection booth and you're, you know, you, you have that anxiety because you're, you're not sure, you know, your hands are wet and you're like, I hope I, I did it right. And then it, wow, the magic on the screen. This is something different. But, but nowadays the tools give us the ability to do so many things uh, closer, faster, uh, and differently. It's, it's another time, uh, another tools. And, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not nostalgic. It's just different. 
<laughs> yeah, it is very different. Uh, yeah. I am slightly nostalgic, <laughs> but not a huge amount. It's um, yes. Now I look at some of the amazing things that that are uh, come on the screen now, and and it's things which I could only have dreamt about. It, it, it was amazing. What yeah. when, when you started off? I know when I started off, I, I started underwater and then I thought, I don't want to do just that. I want to move and do other things as well. And at the time, I felt you were always pigeonholed into a category of things that mm -hmm. you should do. And it's very difficult to break out of that and do something else. Did you find the same or did, did you find it easy to flow from one thing to another? Uh, there's no such things that easy. I said it again, easy. It's, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I think in, in people's mind, it's so comfortable to be able to put something inside a box. So you have to fit inside a box. And when you're doing a wide array of things, they're just lost. It's like, are you doing documentary or, oh, are you doing feature as well and commercial? and underwater and you do your own film so what what exactly are you doing oh and you explore and then you say, okay you do it all and i think uh my generation it's more difficult to understand that i think the young generation um they they are more at ease because you have to be able to do everything you have to be a filmmaker a, a, an editor a producer you have to be good at marketing so i think maybe now it's easier to accept that, in a sense, you can be a, a, um, a jack of all trade and you don't have to be that only specific person. You know, it's like back then, I remember you were a second camera assistant, not the first camera assistant, a second. It's so different. But nowadays, like, oh, maybe today you're doing sound, tomorrow you'll do something else. But still, to be able to, um, to be really good and an expert at your craft you need to specialize in something even if from time to time you can do some other uh, different kind of filming yeah out of all your i mean amazing amount of awards that you've got for uh, for all of your films so from documentaries to features to commercials have you got a, a favorite which you prefer to work on Oh, yeah. And what I produce for myself, it's only documentary. Um, and my heart is towards uh, documentaries. However, I must say that I love working on other people, feature films or a commercial, because you've got the luxury to have the entire team, um, full e list of equipment, uh, more time, so you have that privilege to have all the proper tool and resources to do exactly the shot you want to do. On documentary nowadays, the budget are smaller and smaller. So it's, it's, um, you, ha you need to be really more creative, which I really love. But on the other hand, I really, you know, like last week uh, we were on the Toyota uh, commercial and just to do 15 seconds, it was a, a team of uh, 32 person, <laughs> the list of equipments. I think we had five tracks of whatever you can dream of, two underwater housing, you know, it's, it's like uh, the best hotel, you know, compared to uh, uh, couch surfing, you know. <laughs> Uh, it is crazy. It is actually crazy. It's, um, yes. And it's quite a culture shock sometimes if you've been on a, on a, uh, a documentary in the middle of a jungle or, or somewhere really sparse and then bang, suddenly you're in a drama and, uh, and you can't do everything, which is the frustrating thing. Cause you, you know, you, you, you can't pull the lens. You can't do that. You can't do the lighting because you're told off. And you say, no, you sit there. It's not your job. And I find that quite frustrating. <laughs> with, with your documentaries, um, what's, your, what's your kind of, do you have a target audience, people that you mainly try to reach? Uh, is it, or is it pretty well everyone? I mean, are you trying to... Uh, educate or inspire, uh, investigate. 
what, what's the main thing behind the documentaries you like to make? I think through the years, it's, it's uh, shifted a little bit. At the beginning, it was more for uh, divers. Uh, my first film was, you know, demystifying uh, cave diving. Uh, but soon enough, it shifted to um, a broader audience. And I must say now, I'm, I really want to talk to a really wide audience that are curious about things that uh, they, they will not have the opportunity or the ability to see. Um, maybe a little bit to educate, um, but more to inspire people and to bring something positive. Um, and what is really funny, the more I did films and where I'm in, in my stage of, uh, of life is that at some point, what is funny, after spending years and years behind the camera, you know, when you are behind the, the camera, you're not in the action. You, you're filming the action, but you're not part of it. And for me, there was a missing link because I saw so many things. I, I filmed so many things, but I, I wanted to take that and to be a living link to the people to empower them to do something. And that's why some of the, my latest films the subject are really linked to something I can bring people with me to do something, to act, to change, not the world, but our living environment. So for example, you know, when, when I did films about uh, the, the fresh water, drinking water, it's to take people with me to do some cleanup in the river or things like that. So it's, um, now it's became a bridge uh, that I use to talk to people to inspire them to take action. Mm. I'm just going to switch off my alarm because I, here we go. Ha. <laughs> okay. I, I did actually leave my phone on for my last interview and that was, there you are. <laughs> but I, I, was, I was able to cut it out, which is quite fortunate, really. Um, with that, uh, so with these documentaries and your audiences, do you ever get feedback? Do you get, do you get people getting in touch with you um, saying you really inspired me, you, you've made me think about life in a different way now? Yeah, and it's, it's the best gift. Because as you know, when you're doing a film and then you've got the, the, the showcase in the theater and that specific evening when you just deliver what you worked on for years, most of the time, and, and you, you give birth to that film and you give it to the audience and then it's not yours anymore. And you just feel so empty because it's done and nothing can be changed. However, people, the way they're gonna receive it, and then if you're able to travel with your film, uh, doing some lectures, uh, speaking engagement, and then you can share with the people it's really amazing how we do have an impact on people. We do bring some knowledge. We do bring some new conversation. We do bring new way of thinking or rethinking how we, we live. And this is, is just amazing. And the more I can go and meet people and talk with them, share with them their point of view, uh, their questions. I love the questions of the audience because it brings me more reflection and it's, you know, it's the raw material for an upcoming project. So for me, it's really the, the, best, uh, the best thing that can happen after a film is finished to be able to, to share it and have feedback from the people. And uh, yeah, it happens sometimes, you know, something really simple like uh, one of my film was in Alaska and people dreamed to go there. And the way they were able to book their trip there, they sent me an email say, hey, you know what? I saw your film two years ago. I just wanted to tell you that I'm going in a couple of weeks. This is like a gift. So this is really nice to have those exchanges and those sharing moments with the audience, yeah. Fantastic. That's uh, really nice, yeah. Because uh, it, it actually takes quite a lot of effort for people to having seen a film, to get in touch with the filmmaker. So they must really feel affected by it just to do that. It's fantastic. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's nice because, you know, like people from the, the media, they talk about uh, either my films or when I did the traverse of the island of Montreal, the, the 44 miles uh, dive. And people find a way to reach me out, you know, with Facebook and all that is pretty simple now. And they just, you know, send me uh, uh, a quote or an email or just a, a message. And it's, it goes from, you know, uh, teenagers to people uh, that are retired. So it's really, uh, it's really nice to, to see that the, maybe the language is so universal because, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, it's just to be uh, uh, mesmerized by something you see that amazing you. And then you feel concerned, attached, because you love that environment and you can just share it. Um, so just to be able to, to have that connection with others, uh, it's really, really nice. It's, it's the best gift of, of being a filmmaker anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And... I, I understand um, that you're going to be doing some blogs for us at Scoobaverse. Is that is that right? Yeah, ma yeah, oh, yeah. We we, <laughs> we we have we have to to work on that, and yeah, uh, we have to to work up. Uh, we we don't have the details yet, but uh, yeah, it's uh, some somewhere in the loop. <laughs> oh, that, that that would be excellent. I mean, what what are you working on next that has the possibility of a blog being attached to it? Oh, as a blog, I think the, um, the, the cleanups in the rivers and different environments is really, really important to me uh, because, you know, everything that goes from land to the rivers to the oceans, I think it's really a, a, a worldwide concern. And the fact that it's, it's so fun to be uh, a diver that goes for trash on the water because it's a, it's a fun hunt because you never know what you're going to find. And so, you know, just to take that, and, and more specifically that most of the people this year, they are stuck in their local diving, and we, we, we don't all live by, you know, amazing warm and blue and infinite uh, visibility, uh, but just to find, okay, there's another opportunity, and maybe go in the river, dive there, discover some stuff, uh, some fishes sometimes, some species that they are not that colorful, but still interesting. And just have some fun, practice and relax on the water by doing something for, you know, the, the community. Yeah, absolutely. That, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, I think you lead an extremely exciting life. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You, um, I see you also, do you lead expeditions? Or do you just yeah. film them? No, I, I do different kind of things. Well, so filmmaking is my main work uh, and everything around it and around on the water becomes part of my life as well. So I lead um, most of the time in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic. Um, so I bring people with me there to be able to dive under the flow edge, uh, to be able to uh, witness you know, polar bears, narwhals, walrus, uh, the, the life and how we camp on the flow edge. Um, I take people to a cave because, uh, of course, I became, you know, like cave diving, CCR, technical trimix instructor, because it was like the natural path, you know, to follow and to know more about the, the skills. So what I do, I take people to sometimes uh, small expeditions. Um, it's small groups. I don't like the big 20-ish and more people, you know. It's always like eight, 10 maximum, and we live together and we do everything together. So it's to be able to take people who are not, what I would say, true explorers, but to take them to a place that is not that well known and bring them in the ambience, in the mood of what it is to be in an expedition. And on top of that, I do, my, I do have with my close team a uh, true expedition, um, either doing, you know, like the big dive I, I did, which took me uh, 30 hours to traverse the island of Montreal or to go to places that we want to document. So it's just to put people together, a small group. Most of the time we're like four, five people, uh, except for the traverse, we were 25 because it was so 
complex and to be able to research, to document, and uh, you know, to find new things and point of interest. And on top of that, some of the expedition are more scientific to take some samples of water, sediment, and more specifically for emerging contaminant, which is another subject that is really uh, uh, dear to me because I want to know more about everything that we are taking back to the, the water. Mm. Out of all of, of your time uh, in the Arctic, I mean, I've only been there for short periods and I'm always told, I have no references from a, long, from a while ago, uh, just how things have changed. Polar bears, walruses, over everything um, decreasing, uh, ice going. What's your experience with that? Um, this year and last year, I couldn't go to the Arctic for obvious reason. Um, the the last time I went, so it was nine, uh, 2019, and we went there for one month. And to answer your question, my assistant was the, the first time she was going for a long period of time on camping on the edge, and it was in June. And she asked me while we were preparing all the equipment and the gear, uh, should I take a, a raincoat? I said, no, it's June in the Arctic. We won't have rain. And maybe snow, but you know, it's just the ice flow is going to slowly melt, but uh, no. And um, we spent 28 days on the flow edge. And amongst those 28 days, we had 10 days of rain. It was just unbelievable. Wow. And I was, because I was like, hey, you know, the probability we're going to have rain are, are so small that you don't really need, you know, to pack that. But uh, thankfully, we did pack some raincoat. So, but it shows you how unpredictable it is, even for the Inuit guide. Uh, when we ask them, okay, do you think that in a day or two, we will be able to pass through the crack to reach the flowage? They couldn't answer. They were clueless. Uh, we had to have information through the satellite phone about the um, satellite images of the flowage to know what to expect. And every single day we were questioning, do we wrap? Do we go home now? Or do we keep trying? And it was the most difficult shoot in the Arctic because it was unpredictable, so difficult to see the animals because the, the flow edge was not the way we, we thought it was going to be, like we are used to. Yeah, so it's um, what is happening in the Arctic is just, you know, it's, it's really like the tip of the iceberg. And what you can see that is the, is the reflection of what is going on everywhere else. But, you know, be seeing that a couple of kilometers of flowage of ice disappear during the night is not something that surprised me anymore. No, it is, it is terrifying um, and so sad, so sad. It's, and it's so hard to, to convince people who aren't there, who haven't seen it, who aren't witnessing it, that not only is it a tragedy, uh, in that location, it's actually going to affect our lives back home, you know, where we continue to work, uh, we still get our food from the groceries, the sun comes out, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very hard to get people to appreciate what is going on and what is about to happen to us all, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you find the people you know within your circles actually understand what's going on or is there a still a vacancy of thought towards that? I think people around me are more and more um, um, sensitive uh, ab about the, the subject. And I think what happened, you know, as the same thing that, that I realized when I was doing documentaries, I was like, okay, I can show a film to the people, but there's something missing. There's a link missing. And it was the same thing to the, to the Arctic, you know. Uh, you talk about the Arctic and the polar bears and all that, but it's, they are not in your background. So, so, you know, tomorrow you won't think about it. And at some point I said, okay, I reach a limit that I need to go uh, past. I need to go beyond to be able to have the people feel 
really and and realize what is going on with with the planet um I know the planet is strong. I'm not that pessimist. Uh, it might be a really dark time for us as human, but the planet will go over that. But for us, what I'm doing now, and that's why I'm doing a lot of work in my community in the St. Lawrence River, which is one, one of the biggest inland uh, um, um, way, you know, marine way uh, in, in, on, on Earth, is to tell people, you know, that water, that specific water, we affect that water, which is our source of drinking water. And it is our responsibility and our chance to do something positive for it. So the more we're doing action in our local community, the more we can talk to the people and at the same time tell them, this is what is going on in the Arctic. This is what is going on here. And you have the living proof in front of your eyes. So you can't deny it. So now it's your choice, but you know. And for me, this is what is important. And that's why, you know, as a scuba diver, we are so powerful witness because we see things, we have cameras, we can show to the people. And when we go to communities, they saw again. So now it's like, it's your perfect choice. You do something or you don't, but you know. Don't, so don't tell me you don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, uh, yes, indeed. I can only say thank you for, for all that you've said. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you and great hearing what you've, what you've got to say about, uh, about the planet as well as your work. And I wish you all success. Um, Thank in the you. With your projects, and um, I really look forward to seeing your first blog for us at Scubaverse. That, <laughs> that, that, that would be great. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, well, I'll say goodbye for now, and uh, once again, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a great uh, evening. You are evening. The end of the, yeah, yep. to the end of the day. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you soon, and I will send you the, the picture and, uh, and a small bill. Thank you very much, Nat. Okay, bye for now. Take, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.